Dr. Sky Cleary is a philosopher and author, best known for her work in the field of existentialism. As well as teaching at Columbia Bernard College and the City College of New York, Sky is also the Associate Director of the Center for New Narratives in Philosophy at Columbia University. Sky's contribution to the world of public philosophy has been extensive, writing for a wealth of publications including the Paris Review, TED Ed, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Business Insider, The Independent and New Philosopher magazine. Sky is also the editor of the American Philosophical Association blog and the author of our focus for this episode, her 2015 book, Existentialism and Romantic Love. We're going to be discussing with Sky the idea of romantic love and what we can learn about love from existentialist philosophers such as Max Stirner, Soren Kierkegaard, Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir and Friedrich Nietzsche. In a world of romantic cinema, novels, love songs, dating apps and self-help books, the dream of romantic love has been sold to many of us. But Sky Cleary thinks we need to take a step back. The worry is that we might blindly sacrifice our freedom, offload our happiness onto another person or use them as a means to our own ends. Existentialism teaches us that we should aim to live authentically and embrace our freedom. Our question for this episode is whether or not our current understanding of romantic love is compatible with such a view. Can Jack meet Jill, fall in love, and not fall down the hill? Should we, can we, and why should we love? So this week in part one, we'll be going to discuss existentialism and romantic love. And in part two, we'll be engaging in some further analysis and discussion. Ho, ho, ho. Nothing says authentic an individual like a pan sidecar sweatshirt. To celebrate episode 50, we release some limited edition sweatshirts, which are beautiful. Fall in romantic love with them or your money back. Head over to www.thepansycast.com forward slash sweatshirts. If you're listening to this before December the 20th, there's still a chance that you can pick up one in time for Christmas. And talking of Christmas, festivities have come early this year as we're giving away three copy of Sky's incredibly relevant, enriching and enjoyable book, Existentialism and Romantic Love. Head over to our Twitter or Facebook page to be in with a chance of winning. Finally, a huge thank you to all of our patrons who support the show. If you head over to www.patreon.com forward slash pansycast, you can pledge your support and get yourself heaps of extra content like our after show, pansycast sweatshirts, access to our monthly live Q&A discussions and episode shout outs. Special thanks goes to our patron, Jim Clare, for pledging his support. Thank you, Jim. Your support is hugely appreciated, and we hope you really enjoy this episode on romantic loving. Cheers, Jim. Thank you. Cheers, Jim. Cheers, Jim. Hello and welcome to episode 52 of the Pan Psycast. I'm the vampire prowling around in the world looking for fresh quarry in order to feed Jack Symes. And I'm joined once again by the sodomasochist cycle of assimilation and appropriation, Mr. Ollie Marley. Hello. And the Regina Olsen to our listeners, Kierkegaard, Mr. Gregory Miller. Hello. And the radically free and authentic Dr. Sky Cleary. Hello. Sky, thank you for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me. So, Sky, we start off all of our interviews with the same question. What is philosophy? I'm going to say what a lot of your uh, guests say is that very simply, it's a love of wisdom. But further than that, it's it's a love of wisdom, not just knowledge. So whereas knowledge is about facts and information, wisdom is more about understanding the world and combining knowledge and experience now, I tell my students that a good place to start is with wonder. Like as Plato said, wonder is the feeling of the philosopher and philosophy begins in wonder. Uh, but I also really love what uh, one of your other former guests said, um, Daniel Dennett, when mm. he said philosophy mm -hmm. is what you're doing when you don't know what the right answers are. So I think questioning is a really big part of philosophy, but it's also a desire to understand our existence. And really, when I'm doing philosophy, I'm just trying to understand what the hell is going on. <laughs> um, and in fact, I was listening to your podcast on Corey Moller, and he tweeted something last week, and he said, philosophy is when you think about something so much that you actually end up understanding it less. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a lot of what philosophy is. It's thinking about things we often take for granted. And as Albert Camus said, we often go through life on autopilot and we only run into problems when we stop and reflect and start asking the question, why? 
Uh, why are we here? Why now? Why me? So I think philosophy is partly about exploring, you know, whether we should live. And as Albert Camus allegedly said, should I kill myself or have a cup of coffee? Um, and he says that the question of suicide is the most important philosophical question. And I, I agree it's super important to ask that. Um, and assuming the answer is coffee, uh, we should be asking then <laughs> how we should live and under what conditions. Then the most important philosophical question becomes, well, what should we do? Hmm. And I also really like Frederick Nietzsche's description where he says, philosophy is visiting all the strange and questionable aspects of existence, which I think is pretty much all of existence. Um, you mentioned Daniel Dennett's description of what philosophy is. And as you'll know, he when we asked him, oh, does it make progress then? He's told us that oh, it's about passing on the right questions uh, to science to then go and figure them out. Uh, would you agree with him here? So we, philosophy is the thing you're doing when you don't know what the answers are. Um, but most of the questions, can they be passed on to science? I guess, does, does philosophy make progress? Yeah, I think philosophy does make progress. And I think of passing on the questions and ways of asking questions and methodologies, passing those on to science is super important. Um, I mean, philosophers come up with super crazy ideas sometimes. So Heraclitus thought that everything was fire and Thales thought everything was water. And now we know that everything isn't just one thing or probably isn't. Or even if it is, it's probably not one of those things. Although I hear maybe the current theory is that everything is the Higgs boson. But, um, <laughs> so science is helping us to answer a lot of questions about how the world is and technology about possibilities for how it could be. And I agree that philosophy is needed to help ask the right questions in those realms. Um, and especially with respect to things like ethics. So I see the role of philosophy to question other disciplines and question methods of doing things like how should we do science or what's an ethical way of doing experiments or if a self-driving car has to kill someone who should it kill mm. you know, that's not something science can answer um, and many of philosophy's questions are always going to be important even if there are no clear answers or objective truths and even if you can't pass the questions on to science directly because philosophy raises questions and issues that are vital to talk about. You know, things like, why are we here? How should we live? How can we live a good life? Or what is love and how should we love? So I don't see philosophy as a progress towards the truth or progress towards knowledge of the platonic forms exclusively. Mm. Um, but a lot of philosophy is, is those questions, new frameworks, new ways of thinking, yeah. new perspectives or new narratives on problems. And it's having conversations to understand more fully and deeply. Mm. And in that vein, then, Sky, how is it that you yourself got into philosophy? Was it from another discipline? Was it from reading existentialism, for instance? Or how is it that you uh, kind of first came across philosophy and thought, ah, this is what I want to do. I want to be a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a bit of a false start and I came to philosophy much later in life, although I did take philosophy in the first year of my undergraduate degree. Hmm. And mm -hmm. I really love logic. I had I took four different subjects in philosophy, um, but I didn't actually understand the allure. So I doubled down on things like mathematics and economics and German language and went and worked in financial markets and management consulting for a few years. And I didn't come back to philosophy until my MBA, which I did at Macquarie University in Sydney. And I mm -hmm. took a few classes that were heavily philosophical. So there was a foundations of management class in which uh, the professor taught things like Homer's Iliad and how companies like General Electric were structured and rewarded like Homeric warrior armies. And he talked about Schopenhauer and Nietzsche and how Freudian psychology has evolved into personality testing, which is now a pseudoscience worth millions of dollars that doesn't predict performance. Um, and I also took uh, an organizational behavior class, which talked about um, freedom in the workplace. And I also took an elective subject called existentialism and entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. where we talked about Heidegger and ambiguity and technology. But I was much more into Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre. And then does that mean that if you hadn't have found philosophy then, you would have still been uh, doing the same job? Or do you think come somewhere down the line you would have gone, no, I need to get out of this as well and I need to find something else? In other words, if you weren't a philosopher, what do you think it is you would be doing? 
That's a really good question. And I'm not sure I can answer that because it was so serendipitous, like how I came to philosophy. It was that I happened to do my MBA at a university, which was heavily mm-hmm. philosophical. And it came to me at the time when I was asking a lot of questions about relationships and how uh, love should be. And it was also around the same time that uh, Hazel Rowley's book, Tete a Tete, came out, mm. which was specifically on the relationship between Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, which seemed to be asking a lot of the same questions that I was asking about relationships. Um, so it was kind of a nexus of a lot of different things that um, collided at the same time. Um, so it's it's possible that I would still be working in um finance or management consulting if I hadn't came across these these um, the book like tete a tete and and had these classes hmm. before you um, started doing philosophy I guess growing up um, in your teenage years where most people start to have these things did you have any do you remember have any distinctly philosophical thoughts growing up were you always concerned with questions pertaining to existentialism you know what the purpose of life is and things like this and not probably not existentialism so much. However, um, my parents had studied RET, you know, Albert Ellis's psychology of rational emotive behavioral therapy. Um, and the central mantra of that is we're not upset by things around us, but rather by the views we take of them. Mm. So this was a psychology that developed out of stoicism and there was a little bit of existentialism in there. So some of my earliest memories were of my parents asking me why I'm upsetting myself. Right. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> I, I, uh, so I started off with those kind of ideas and, and questioning whether that's true. Does that mean Tet a Tet was the first philosophical text you read, or do you was it was the first one you read when you were an undergraduate? Say, can you remember what that was? So, in, for example, most of our guests will say something like Plato's Republic or Descartes' Meditations. Can you remember what yours was? I have no recollection of what I read in my undergraduate degree in philosophy. Mm. However, I do remember, um, I think it was when I was in middle school, I remember reading Jonathan Livingston Seagull by Richard Bach. And I just remember being deeply moved by it. And I know, you know, it's controversial as to whether that's actually, you know, a philosophical text or not, but I do think it includes a lot of philosophical ideas. And I mean, it's been ages since I've read it, but I do look back and see that there were some existential themes in there, like rebellion against conformity of the flock and Jonathan Livingston Seagull pursuing his passion for flying and becoming authentic. So I, so that was probably one of the earliest texts that I read in a philosophical way. But the text that really sparked my interest was uh, The Mandarins by Simone de Beauvoir. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a book that won the Prix Goncourt in 1954. And it's about a group of intellectuals after World War II trying to figure out what to do. And it's very loosely based on Simone de Beauvoir's life and her relationships. And it's heavily political, but it also kind of in, the text is infused with many of the like existential and feminist themes that she deals with in The Second Sex. So that was probably the book I came across. And I came across that during my MBA because when I chased down one of the professors after first hearing about Simone de Beauvoir in one of my classes, and I said, this is fascinating. I want to know more. What can you recommend? And this was one of the first books that my professor recommended. And that was actually before I discovered Hazel Raleigh's tete-a-tete. Ah. Um, a classic pan question we like to ask our guests is whether or not they've uh, had a significant change in philosophical position throughout their lives. And we're really looking for another example here because constantly we say uh, we had Eugene Nagasawa on the show who converted from um, atheism and materialism to theism and a form of dualism or panpsychism to non-materialism. And Peter Singer moving from um, preference to hedonistic utilitarianism. So we're looking for another example to add to this list. So is there any uh, significant philosophical uh, thesis you used to hold, which you've let now went on to abandon? Well, I haven't abandoned Uh, a philosophical view completely. And I think that's because when I came into philosophy, I kind of embraced the existential um, Mm. philosophers. And so I somehow have been (laughs) sticking with the existential philosophers since then, although I am branching out now and um, I'm teaching a lot of uh, other texts like uh, Plato's Symposium and Mm. and Bell Hooks and things like that. Um, So, yeah, I guess I maybe I haven't had enough time to switch my views. However, yeah. I 
I do you hold any shaky philosophical positions that you might abandon soon? <laughs> so, uh, um, Greg, Greg's a panpsychist, you see, so he's our go-to example for a, a position which is a little bit wobbly. <laughs> so Greg, you read me across the room. Here. <laughs> <Sorry>. yeah, <laughs> um... <laughs> um, so I think, I mean, I embrace the existentialist but fairly early on and it's not like I'm rejecting them outright now, but I, I'm starting mm. to realize where they uh, might not be right. Um, okay. So when I first read Kierkegaard's Either Or, I was like, wow, this is amazing. But then I realized, I guess I was reading Diary of a Seducer and I realized he was such a jerk and it was kind of the way <laughs> Kierkegaard treated Regina Olsen. No. He was like, that was kind of horrible. So I'm just um, kind of refining my views in existentialism, but I'm not shifting like radically. Mm. So I'm not rejecting existentialism just yet. So we've been using this term existentialism, Sky. Uh, for our listeners, could you explain what existentialism is and what it is about existentialism that you're so drawn to, to to write a book about it? Sure. Yeah. Existentialism, it's really hard to define because it's really a loose affiliation of philosophers and authors and some psychologists who talked about themes like freedom, choice, responsibility, anxiety and death. So existentialism can't really be summed up in a tagline very easily, although there are foundational themes like existence precedes essence and mm. God is dead. Mm. Um, existentialism is its not a life hack because it's much more descriptive than prescriptive, which is why often the existential philosophers wrote uh, diaries or published diaries and wrote novels and plays. Um, it's also not specifically a therapy. Um, so it's not an antidote to life's frustrations. But the existentialists were reacting to the Enlightenment when everything was about science and objectivity and facts and being detached. And the existentialists said, well, what about the individual subjective passionate experience? Hmm. Um, and so the existential thinkers emphasized concrete living and the importance of being engaged in life. And Simone de Beauvoir says, I take on shape and existence only if I first throw myself into the world by loving and doing. So it's a very engaged philosophy. Um, and I like it because it's asking questions about why life is worth living and what's worth living and dying for. And the emphasis is that it's up to each individual to create their own reason for being. But we can only find that meaning by engaging in the world and with other people. And so much so that Jean-Paul Sartre says, we wouldn't know ourselves without other people. Oh, good. And obviously a lot of people's answer to that question of, you know, what gives my life meaning? People are gonna say love, right? Love is the answer. All you need is love. Um, you <laughs> know, it doesn't feel like your words there, are they? I think that's copyrighted. <laughs> I know, right? Um, what, what is it that got you interested in, in thinking about and, you know, um, analyzing the questions of uh, what is romantic loving? Why why romantic loving? What, what was it about it that you found so interesting? So I became really obsessed with the question as to whether you can choose to love. Um, some people say love chooses you. And so this is something, it seems to be easy to, you know, choose to stop loving someone. Like when you break up, you can choose to stop. But then I was like, well, is the converse true? Can you choose to start loving someone? And I was deeply uncomfortable with that, with that question. Um, I also started reading Irving Singer, who uh, wrote extensively on the philosophy of love. And there was something he said that really caught my attention, which was, when you fall in love, the freedom that you give up is compensated by the love you receive in return. And so I became particularly interested in this question between freedom and what we're expected to do for love and authenticity and what we're expected maybe to give up for love because I was in a relationship and negotiating and asking questions about uh, how much time I should spend studying versus how much time I should spend uh, hanging out with my boyfriend. And mm. we used to have arguments about this all the time. <laughs> I'm sure some and, listeners can sympathize. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I started wondering, well, what is it that we're channeled into doing? Like, why are these pressures around? Why am I feeling pressured to 
uh, give up things that I'm passionate about for a relationship. And then I started asking bigger questions about why people get married at all. Uh, what is, what's the reason for it? I was looking around and seeing that you know, something like over 40% of marriages were ending in divorce. Mm. So it didn't make sense to me. And a lot of the people who were still married seemed to be really unhappy. So I'm like, why is this a good structure for relationships? Is it a good structure? Are there better structures? And that's something that interested me about Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre, which was particularly in this book, Tete a Tete, because they rebelled against like the social norms of uh, getting married and having children you know they they tried something different they tried something that was authentic for them which was let's not get married let's not live together let's not have children but let's have a relationship in which we're primary lovers so we're we're really important to one another mm. They would give each other as much freedom as possible which included the freedom to have relationships with other people uh, now, I wasn't particularly interested in having relationships with other people, but I admired what they were trying to do. And I admired mm. the, their rebellion against, you know, the standard social narrative of uh, finding the one, getting married, living happily ever after. And one other question we always ask people uh, in this kind of introduction section is what other things th are they looking to research on? Is there anything that kind of sparks your interest at the moment and you'd like to move on to look at and you, I mean, a moment ago you mentioned bell hooks bell hooks is that right yes now my understanding is bell hooks a historian bell hooks is more of a social activist and cultural critic and she wrote a book called all about love where she argues that love can be a transformative force for the better um, but the problem is that we're not taught what love is or how to love well now, family is meant to be the place where we learn about love, but so many of us grow up in dysfunctional families, and so we end up growing up to become quite cynical about love. And capitalism exploits that cynicism by telling us that shopping is going to fill our emotional void. And I also like Bell Hooks because she makes an important existential point. She says, quite rightly, I think, that we treat love as a noun when we ought to be thinking of it as a verb so love is an intention it's an action it's a choice and this also means that love is something uh, not that we find but something we do and it's something we can practice and become better at and bell hooks talks about true love as being caring and affectionate and respectful and based on trust um, and that also means that abuse and neglect can't coexist with love so if you have an abusive spouse and they say oh but i love you well that's wrong they, they don't love you because that abuse is not a loving action uh, however i'm also doing more research into other women philosophers for example, Tullia D'Arangona, who was a high Renaissance Italian courtesan who wrote a fun and kind of sassy platonic style dialogue about whether love is infinite. And Mary Cavendish, who philosophized about gender and power. Part one, existentialism and romantic love. Now, Sky, when I teach my undergraduate students how to do philosophy, so say we're in week one or week number one, philosophy 101, along with other methods, I often start them off with like two questions to kind of highlight what philosophy is. And I'll always something, give them a question like, what is knowledge? Or I'll say, what is love? And I, I try to use these examples because they seem to me to be obviously philosophical questions, right? I mean, I've got to analyse the concept of knowledge. There's no kind of, I can't look under a stone and find out what the answer to what is knowledge is. There's no empirical evidence that's going to tell me that. And likewise, I'm not going to like um, do some measurements, shake a test tube around and find out what love is. Um, so to ask you this typically philosophical question, what is love? And in particular, what is romantic love? That's a good question. And in fact, I always start my classes with asking students before I've said anything, before I've talked about any philosophers, I ask them to write down what is love or what does love mean to them. And 
You, know, you get some amazing, um, beautiful uh, descriptions. Um, so for me, romantic love is a passionate attachment that includes sexual desirability, even if it's not consummated. It's also personal, which means that it's love of a particular individual or appreciation of that person's unique qualities, and that differentiates it from something like spiritual love. Um, it also includes the hope that it will last, maybe not forever, but at least beyond the night. Um, that differentiates it from just a fleeting, lusty kind of relationship. Um, and mm -hmm. it also includes some kind of yearning for a union. And, you know, the philosophers talk about this in lots of different ways. Sometimes it's the desire to merge. Sometimes mm. it's to create a shared identity or to share selves or to become interdependent or to entwine lives so much that the, the lover's boundaries are blurred or overcome. Um, so there's also an element of switching the focus from an I to a we. So it's not just when we make decisions, it's not just about what am I going to have for dinner, it's what are we going to have for dinner. So it's, uh, it's a narrative shift that means that when we're making decisions, we're taking into account the interests of the other person. Um, and there are lots of other definitions of love. You know, sometimes uh, people include a concern for the beloved's welfare. You know, that's something that Harry Frankfurt focused on. Um, some people uh, say that intimacy is an important part of it or companionship. Mm -hmm. And um, in your book, you mention some other, uh, well, in your book, you mentioned before the existentialist kind of concept of love was, was developed or they kind of looked at it or analyzed it. Sorry, there were these other models that already existed. Could you run us through what those models were? Yeah. So I, do you mean the um, different sort of theories of love or are you yeah. talking about oh, arranged no. marriages and things like that? Uh, I mean, the different theories of love, for instance. So you oh, say okay. there's, the, the, for example, there is the merging model, right? And, um, right. Yeah, so there are lots of different ideas or theories about how to think about love. So um, one of them is the kind of mythological or spiritual view that mm. love is a project of finding a soulmate, that there's someone out there made just for you. Mm. And really all love boils down to is it's a matter of luck or chance or hard work to go out there and find the one. And that's an idea that's been around for thousands of years. It's something that Plato talked about in Symposium. Uh, Aristophanes, the um, comic poet, said that we used to be mm. these large creatures, round creatures with four arms and four legs and <laughs> two faces. And one day we pissed off the gods and so Zeus cut us all in two. And um, since then we've been kind of roaming the world trying to find our other half and merge back into our original organic whole. Hmm. And so I, when you hear people talking about you know, this, my soulmate or my other half or being made for each other, that kind of refers back to that myth. And it blows my mind that that was almost two and a half thousand years ago yeah. and we're still using this kind of language. Um, and of course, there are some scientific views about love that says love is biological or evolutionary and it's all about survival of the species. Um, you know, Schopenhauer is a philosopher that took on this view as well that Love is a sexual impulse, which is just a voluptuous illusion that tempts us towards those people who seem to promise us happiness and pleasure. Mm. But really, it's just a trick that Mother Nature plays on us to get us to have babies, and the species is the only one that ends up happy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah, lots of other um, – another one is that love is a chemical reaction. Right. Mm. Neuroscientists are finding that there are uh, hormones in our brain, things like dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin that seem to fluctuate when we fall in love. Um, but we don't know why they get triggered with certain people. Um, mm. Maybe it's uh, figuring out what kind of genes are complementary. And y y we get into all these crazy experiments like sniffing sweaty T-shirts and gross stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are also psychological views that say love is a combination of things like companionship and intimacy and commitment. Uh, or there are ideas that suggest that romantic love is a narrative and that people fall in love because they have similar stories or 
complementary roles within those stories. Mm. Um, and another view is that love is a way to expand ourselves. It's a way that we grow or reach out into the world. And this, some of these um, ideas resonate with uh, the existential views, especially, for example, Nietzsche, because Nietzsche suggests that um, when we fall in love, um, love or the best kind of love is where lovers challenge us and push us in ways that we might not have thought about on our own. So, so why is it that we do love if this isn't too much of a, a challenging question? I mean, is it a yearn for unity like Plato says, or is it to trick us into having children like Schopenhauer? Do we love out of fear of loneliness? Is it something misleading? Do we love to reach beyond ourselves? Why is it that we do love? I think it's a combination of things, if that's not a cop out. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think from an existential perspective, mm. I think it's up to the individuals in the relationship to figure out what's meaningful for them and why they want to be in a relationship. So some people want to be in a relationship because they want a family and they want to have babies and that's fine. Some people want to be in a relationship to be challenged and pushed in ways, uh, in new ways. Um, other people, uh, fall in love and, and, and have a relationship because it does feel like, like that they've found a soulmate. Mm. But for other people, you know, that soulmate feeling may not be quite as important. So I think there are lots of different uh, reasons why people fall in love. So Sky, your book, Existentialism and Romantic Love, is, is excellent. And in that book, you, you focus on five philosophers. So we've got Max Stirner, Soren Kierkegaard, Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, and Friedrich Nietzsche. Now, can you just say... You don't have to do all five, of course, but why? what was it about these philosophers that you thought had something interesting to say about love? Why, why these five? Yeah, so this isn't an exhaustive list by any means, um, and they're not even all existentialists. Like, Max Stirner's not an existentialist. Mm. You know, there's a lot of people debating as to whether Frederick Nietzsche is an existentialist. Right. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard was classified an existentialist retrospectively, and... Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir resisted the existential label, but they everyone kept calling them existentialists, so they kind of embraced it uh, later on. But the reason why I chose these five is because they all talk about existential themes and they all talk about love. Um, and often they talk a lot about the frustrations and disappointments of love, where love can go wrong and ways that we can love better. So the main idea in my book was that it's really important to free ourselves from misplaced expectations and flawed ideals about how we should love hmm. um, so that we can be free to create more authentically meaningful relationships. And when I'm talking about, so that's two aspects of freedom, freedom from, which is about being free from oppression, and then freedom to, which is about being free to uh, choose who you can be in a relationship with. And mm. that's a fairly new idea because up until a few hundred years ago, most re most relationships or most marriages were arranged and you didn't get to be with the person you're in love with. And where love did occur or where passionate love occurred was usually outside marriage. So the when I'm talking about misplaced expectations and flawed ideals, I'm particularly exploring these ways of being in relationships that we've been brought up to believe, like Hollywood fairy tales or yeah. family and social expectations that the standard model is get married, have babies and live happily ever after. But mm. I wanted to test that idea that, well, is there one person and what does it mean to be happily ever after? Um, so in the modern day, like you say, um, you know, we've got all these things. We've got romantic novels, romantic film, and we've also got lots of things like uh, technological revolution, things like dating apps. Um, so I was infringing upon Greg's privacy yesterday evening and stumbled upon one of your many dating apps, Greg. Uh, let, let's call it Hinder. And um, I noticed that Greg had selected an exclusive group of his desirable attributes and included some mildly seductive photographs with some distasteful filters. Uh, after digging a little deeper, Greg, I found myself in your messages. And as I read, it seemed like you weren't presenting yourself authentically. You hadn't mentioned any of your shaky philosophical <laughs> positions. Um, Scott, is Greg doing anything wrong here with presenting this very uh, exclusive view of himself? 
<laughs> so I think that's probably what everybody does on uh, the dating apps, but I not that I have been on the dating apps. Um, but uh, A, I think that's pretty standard. B, I think um, that Frederick Nietzsche would have a problem with that mm. um, because he says that the problem with dating apps is, well, he didn't talk about dating apps, of course, but <laughs> I, think, I think what he would have said is that it focuses on very superficial attributes of people. And yeah, studies have shown that most people don't actually tell um, the the truth about themselves. And, you know, how much can you understand about somebody from, you know, a quick photo or, you know, a very brief snapshot? Mm. And problem is that we're focusing too much on initial impressions without actually taking the time to get to know someone. So with dating apps, I think that uh, it's great, a great way to meet people, but we need to find a way to refocus it from superficial judgments to mm. a kind of deeper uh, level of understanding. If what we want is for um, is to find meaningful relationships, and Frederick Nietzsche said that you know the most important thing in a relationship is to find someone who you can talk to, mm. because uh, usefulness and beauty and um, attraction they're all probably going to wear off a little bit. But the um, best partner is going to be the person who is um, a best friend. Uh, following on from the kind of topic of Nietzsche there, Sky, um, and as we know, like, he is a pretty peculiar guy. And as you say in his, your book, he can, often he can, kind of contradicts himself. So in one aphorism, he'll say one thing, and then later in another, he'll say something else. Uh, and now, one thing interesting thing that Nietzsche said is that uh, no philosopher, particularly great ones, can be married or have a life partner. So here's the here's a quote from Nietzsche here. So he says, "Thus, the philosopher dislikes marriage as well as what might persuade him into it. Marriage is a barrier and a disaster along his route to the optimal." What great philosopher up to now has been married? Heraclitus, Plato, Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Kant, Schopenhauer? <laughs> None of these got married. What's more, we cannot even imagine them married. A married philosopher belongs in a comedy. That's my principle. And Socrates, the exception, the malicious Socrates, it appears, got married ironically to de demonstrate this very principle. Uh, so, why is it then, Sky, do you think, what is Nietzsche saying here? Because Nietzsche, I don't think, is obviously against marriage across the board, or does he think there's something particular about philosophers that isn't uh, for lay people? Where marriage can be for, you know, the everyday citizen, but philosophers in their ivory towers, they are forbidden for being married. What is he saying here? <laughs> Yeah, and so that's another point where he's contradictory on because elsewhere he says uh, free spirits need marriage like bitter medicine or mm. something like that. Um, so, yeah, he was really sceptical of marriage uh, because um, he, he worried that when people – uh, get married, they try and um, possess one another and mm. they're always trying to stop one another from doing things and really it's just a distraction from striving towards the ideal of the ubermensch, which is to creatively and passionately go beyond and strive for great things. Um, and so he saw that um, marriage tends to be very restrictive and it tends to bind us in like, I think he said, tends to bind us like spider webs. Um, mm. and, but what he also thought was that there is actually a really important role for marriage. And that is when you go into a relationship. He, he was disgusted that everybody was getting married for love. He says marriage is based on love, have error for their father and misery for their mother. <laughs> <laughs> because, and he advised people not to walk down the aisle while they're in love because he's like, you're making a really long-term important commitment based on something that's frivolous and fleeting. And it's absurd to turn a brief folly such as 
romantic love into a lifelong commitment. Um, but he also saw that there was high value in making a commitment that you can stick to. So he also said elsewhere that if we're going to get married, make a commitment and let's see to it that we stay in love. Mm -hmm. So he kind of shifts the focus from, you know, maybe you fall in love, but make love a choice. And so, uh, I don't know, did I answer your question? Yeah, so it's that, so in part he's being contradictory, right? He's doing that typical Nietzsche thing because he's saying, well, look, philosophers can't get married, but really he's saying, but everyone needs to get married, but they also need to do it rationally and sensibly. They can't do it in the midst of the throes of passion. Oh, well, that's the wrong phrase. They can't do it in lust, right? They must do it a step. They must step back and then take some time. But do you think so, that... He, he thinks that philosophers are somehow like more freer spirits and need to uh, uh, strive higher up the mountain or something like this. And that's why he said it this, in the, this instance. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, however, he said that, I think it's Zantip. Is that how you say Socrates' wife's name? Zantip. Mm, I'm not sure. No, I'm not I'm sure. sure. Okay. So, um, all right, well, maybe don't uh, include that. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Yeah, I mean, even he says Socrates, even though Socrates' wife was really horrible to him, he said it was still important for Socrates to have that because she challenged him in ways that no one else could. Hmm. Um, but Nietzsche wasn't saying we have to be all rational about uh, commitment and marriage. Right. He hmm. was very much about um, having the Dionysian and the Apollonian aspects of life. So mm. being rational, but also in concert with uh, being passionate about life. Uh, so it wasn't one over the other. And in fact, he criticized um, Socrates for placing, you know, rationality above the passions. Right. And he thought they were both really important. So moving on from Nietzsche then onto Max Stirner. So Max Stern is also critical of romantic love, as he believes if lovers conform to pre-established expectations about how they should feel and behave, they do not truly own themselves. To own themselves, lovers would create themselves as unique lovers. Just wondering if you could unpack what Stern's view is here, Sky, and if his view is, is possible. Is it possible to be a, a truly unique lover? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so Max Stern's view was based on the idea that man has killed God, hmm. or at least... God should never have been taken seriously. Um, and that's a phrase that Nietzsche was famous for, but in fact, Stoner said it before Nietzsche did. Um, and uh, Stoner's point was that without inherent authority and morals and values in the world, the key problem then becomes how best to enjoy life. So Stoner said that the point of life is not to know yourself as the ancient Greeks thought, but rather to get value out of yourself. And he thought that love is a really great way to enrich our lives, um, but not only love of other people, but also self-love. And so his focus was on self-ownership and self-acceptance and self-interest. And we create unions to extend our power on the world and to expand ourselves. His ideas about ownness or what he calls eigenheit, mm. I see as a very early understanding of authenticity, which is choosing what interests you for your own sake. Um, and so he had a problem with love that is uh, based on dependency and duty and obligation. He had a problem with the idea that love should be unselfish. And he's like, how can love be unselfish? Why would you be in a relationship with someone who you didn't want to be in a relationship with? He's like, mm. why? Like, that's not enjoying life. And he's like, if you bump into a friend walking down the street and your friend says, let's go have a drink, do you mm. go out of duty or do you go because you think it would be an enjoyable experience? And he says, if you go out of duty, then you're just being crazy. Like, but, you know, it's fine. You know, of course, we have, you know, friends and we have lovers because it's enjoyable for us. OK, Sky, um, to quote David Bowie. This modern love ain't going to get me to the church on time. <laughs> Why is Kierkegaard anxious about romantic loving, romantic loving? And how will what he calls the leap of faith solve this anxiety that we have towards romantic loving? 
Yeah, so I kick it out so love as something beautiful and intoxicating and just an amazingly incredible experience. But his problem with romantic loving was that it's immature when the focus is on pleasure and immediate gratification. And he's like, all too often love relationships, they're, they're frivolous and empty and, mm. and meaningless. And you know, thinking about serial monogamous, we just go through the same cycle over and over again in a yeah. monotonous way. Um, and so he thought the solution to that was leaping out of romance, turning love into a duty, which means getting married. And so mm -hmm. he thought in Either Or, which is one of his um, most famous books and I, I think one, one of the best existential books of all, he talks about uh, Don Giovanni or mm. Mozart's Don Giovanni, who is the ultimate aesthete. He's the ultimate representative of romantic loving because he's always skimming from woman to woman, and but he's a great lover and he's really great at what he does. And I think Kierkegaard was... A little bit envious of Don Giovanni, um, but he also uh, thought that that was one of the lower forms of romantic love. And so to create more meaningful relationships, um, we need to bring stability and a form of constancy to relationships, which we do by leaping to a higher ethical realm, which involves marriage. But right. he also thought that ultimately we need to leap to, he was uh, religious, so ultimately we need to re leap to a higher religious sphere, which is um, loving those you see and not a commitment just to one person, but a commitment to being a loving person. Okay, so I uh, find myself in a bookshop and I find a, um, a, a beautiful woman reaching for the same copy of Peter Singer's uh, The Most Good You Can Do and I fall in love with this person <laughs> and I get this feeling for months on end, you know, I'm head over heels for them and then that uh, feeling ends and I try and find the same again and doing this repetitively, Kierkegaard says, I'm just a slave to my desires and you need to reach for something more. So this thing, marriage or perhaps uh, love of God or something like this, take the leap of faith. Um, does he have any prescription of how I should act when I'm in this marriage? So I just say, oh, I'm not going to get this feeling forever. So I'm going to marry this person. Um, wh what do I do, do then once I'm married? So in marriage, what you're doing is not committing to the other person as much as you are committing to yourself being a loving person. So you're mm. committing to the duty of being in love, um, or duty of marriage. And so that's your commitment. So yeah, he, he acknowledges that maybe your feelings are going to wane and that passionate uh, realm is going to wear off. But he thinks that the, um, the feeling of security that you get from being in a marriage is much better than any frivolous, fleeting uh, relationship that you could be in. So we spoke uh, in our last episode about Simone de Beauvoir um, and long ago, in, back in episode 17, we had a, a whole series as well on Jean-Paul Sartre um, and, and the relationship between de Beauvoir and Sartre we've mentioned on several occasions. Famously, although having a loving long-term relationship, they had an open relationship throughout their lives. Could you unpack for us uh, why this was? Um, was it difficult for them? And for them, was it worth it? Yes, yeah, so it's hard for me to judge whether they thought it was worth it. Um, but uh, Simone de Beauvoir always maintained that her life was freely chosen. Uh, so uh, just briefly what it was. Um, okay, so they met at the Sorbonne University mm. um, in the late 1920s and they competed for the top prize, the aggregation. Um, Sartre won, but it was his uh, second time taking it. Um, and so they went on to have this relationship, uh, lifelong relationship, and now they're buried together in um, Paris's Montparnasse Cemetery. Uh, so what Jean-Paul Sartre always wanted to have freedom in his relationships. And mm. he said he always offered this grand gift of freedom to his girlfriends. Um, and then when he started to see Simone de Beauvoir, he said he offered her this freedom and she took it and hoisted him on his own petard. Um, and he was shocked that she did that. And she's like, no, I'm okay with free having freedom in relationships. Um, but they didn't want it to be just about sex. So they wanted to 
give each other the freedom to fall in love with other people because if it was just sex then it was a cheap and meaningful form of freedom and they did go and have like really intense long-term relationships uh, with other people but they always remained uh, primary to one another and I think there were challenges in that relationship that they acknowledged and Simone de Beauvoir said I think we're a little bit overly obsessed with freedom and one of the flaws in our model was that we didn't take into account the third person the other people in the relationships weren't existentialists and mm. they were often really hurt and jealous that yeah. Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre, you know, remained primary to one another and, and didn't leave one another. So we've, we've banged the nail right on the head here, right? So we've got a, a flawed perception of romantic loving in, in the 21st century. We think we're going to find the one that there's someone out there for us. Um, you know, we've got, you know, massively high divorce rates. Um, so let's just all be polyamorous. That's the solution <laughs> to all of our problems, right? Like surely this is... This is the solution. Is that right? <laughs> well, that's one option. Um, Carrie Jenkins, uh, another philosopher, uh, she speaks extensively about polyamory and she's written a book recently about it. Um, so, but I think from an existential perspective, that's not necessarily the path to go down. And yeah. that's mm -hmm. not, yeah, Simone de Beauvoir and Jean Paul Sartre went down that path. But from an existential perspective, it's up to the individuals in the relationship to create a relationship that's authentically meaningful for them. And if that includes polyamory, then that's fine too. But for a lot of people, I think, are happier and feel more secure and fulfilled in a monogamous relationship. And mm. that's okay too. And you know what? Even not being in a relationship is fine too. Um, there's also, um, and this is something Kerry Jenkins talks about, is um, there's a stigma attached to not being in a romantic relationship. Mm. So, and maybe love isn't for everybody, um, and that's okay too. And, and kind of following on from that, you know, is it is it possible? Do we think then, Sky, to be in a romantic relationship and be radically free? Because surely a relationship, by definition, if we've got this removal of the I and the inclusion of the we, doesn't that sort of necessitate some form of compromise mm. or some form of impingement on freedom in some way? Yeah, and I think it's a really hard compromise and that's a real tension because it's not annihilating the I, but it's talking about the, the people in the relationship as a we, but without getting rid of the I. So it's, it's a tension. Um, and the existentialists recognize that we can't be free from everything. Um, you know, some things are out of our power. You know, maybe we can't choose who we're attracted to, um, but we can choose how we behave in romantic relationships. We can choose how we act on that attraction. We can choose whether we swipe left or right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Interesting, Greg. Uh, so, yeah, and however, relationships do tend to call for compromise. Um, however, uh, Nietzsche talks about this um, in, he talks about ships, a star friendship where two ships mm. come together and rest for a while in a harbor and have a beautiful time. And then the sea, the winds sort of, they, they set off on their path again and the winds sort of push the ships away from one another. And that's one of my favorite quotes. And especially when we're talking about romantic love, is that, you know, we do come together and we do have, you know, beautiful times together, but that doesn't mean we have to stay together or that the relationship is a failure because we didn't stay together. Right. In okay. one of Nietzsche's aphorisms, he talks about maybe we need three different relationships throughout our life. One mm. when we're younger to, to learn about what love is. One when we're um, in sort of middle age when we can teach someone younger. And then one when we're older, to, you know, so we can uh, grow old and have great conversations together. So I think the existentialists were challenging this idea that there is the one. There is mm. this soulmate. Like maybe there is more than one, but maybe there is one. And that's okay if you find someone who you're happy with and you can live a fulfilling life with for uh, your your entire life until you die. And that's, that's great. But for most of us, for many of us, like that's not actually the case. 
Mm. Me and um, Ollie were sharing lunch earlier on, weren't we, Ollie? And yeah. um, you turned to me and said, oh, this is a great first date, Jack. And I said, I hope it lasts. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you call this um, uh, masturbating or something like this. So it must last a long time, this desire that we all have for a long relationship. And that's the measure of a good relationship. A lot of people. We applaud the people who have been married for 50 years, regardless of the quality. Hands together for these, this wonderful couple that, couple that have been together for so long. Uh, a final question in the section. Sky. I'm just wondering what your advice would be, what kind of message um, you want. You would... So reading through your book, there's a wealth of um, excellent, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for here? I'm stumbling myself now. Um, so looking through your book, there's lots of messages we can take from it, lots of prescriptions which are valuable for our own life or descriptions of um, romantic love. Um, so what message would you like to give to lovers in the 21st century? What's your message to the Jack or Jill that wants to go up the hill and not break their crowns? Sure. Uh, so there are a few things I'd say. And first of all, that love isn't about finding perfect harmony and oneness. Love is rather about creating a relationship in which both people can grow and flourish. And having common goals helps, you know, something to talk about and laugh together. Um, I would also say romantic love that lasts forever tends to be the exception, not the rule. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. You know, we go into marriages thinking it's this romantic aspect is going to last forever. Maybe it changes into companionate love or conjugal love, and that's okay. And maybe we there are ways we can get the romance back, uh, and may, and you know, maybe we should be striving to do that too. Uh, so I would also say that relationships will be better when lovers are friends, meaning mm. that people respect each other's freedom and they're supportive rather than being controlling and um, oppressive. I think it's also important to note that love can be a source of anxiety and that's an integral part of love for the existentialists because we don't know how long the relationship's going to last. We don't know whether the other person's going to love us back. Um, but what is important is for us to leap in and, and try it anyway. It's only nine days until Christmas, so embrace your radical freedom and pick up a pan Psychast sweatshirt on our website. There's a link in the iTunes description. Thank you again to all of our patrons. Um, join us next week. We'll be engaging in some further analysis and discussion with Sky Cleary on the eve, eve of the birth of the Son of God. <laughs> <laughs> you can't laugh at that point. Sorry. <laughs> I apologise for our adverts, Sky. They're truly terrible. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sci Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sci Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That's that was that great. Was that was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Great. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're yeah. doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>